Hello dear friends, welcome back to my channel Quick Literature Guide. I am your companion and guide through this fascinating history of English literature. In our last video, we discussed on complete biography of Geoffrey Chaucer, his important works, and Chaucer as the earliest of the moderns. Those who have not seen my previous videos may go to my channel page and watch them for a better comprehension. In this video, we are discussing an important event, Reformation in England. This is quite complicated topic as it was a long process of change in religious beliefs and practices in England. Each event is related to the former. So, for a clear and better understanding, please do not skip the video and watch till the end. Before beginning our discussion, I request if you have not subscribed to my channel yet, then please subscribe it and press the bell icon for notifications of more informative and interesting videos to come. So, let's get started. The Reformation was like a big change in the 16th century that completely transformed how things were in England. It changed the way people believed in God, how society worked and even how the government was set up. Earlier, at the start of the 16th century, England was a predominantly Catholic nation under the authority of Pope in Rome. But during the Reformation, new types of Christian beliefs called Protestantism started to grow. Let us know why this Reformation happened. What were the several factors that paved the way for the Reformation? First reason was influence of Renaissance. The Renaissance was a cultural and intellectual movement that swept across Europe during the 14th to 17th centuries. It was characterized by a revival of art literature, philosophy, and learning from classical antiquity. This movement had a significant impact on the people's mindset, encouraging them to question traditional beliefs and authority. Here are some examples to make it clearer. Imagine one day, everyone suddenly got it. They realized that every single person is important and has their own unique talents. Back in the Renaissance period, which was like a long time ago, there was this cool idea called humanism. Basically, it said, let's focus on people and what they can do instead of just following what religious leaders said. People started using their brains to figure out things and look at the world around them. So, it's like uh, if your teacher says something and you're like, hmm, I'm gonna think about that myself and see if it makes sense. People got really into thinking for themselves and using their own smarts to understand stuff. This made them question what religious leaders were saying and trying to find answers using their own thinking power. It was a big change from just taking things on faith. Second factor was arrival of printing press. Imagine if you could make lots of copies of a book really quickly. That's what the printing press did. Earlier, books were hard to make and not many people could read them. But with the printing press, books and pamphlets became more accessible and more people could read them. This helped in spread of new and different ideas that were not controlled by the church or the powerful leaders. Another important reason was exploration and exchange. Think about meeting people from faraway places with different ideas and ways of doing things. During the Renaissance, explorers traveled to new lands and met different cultures. This made people realize that there are many ways to think and believe, not just what they were told by the church. They started to question why their own beliefs were the only right ones. Another reason was the corruption in the churches. In the late medieval period, which was before the Renaissance, the Catholic Church started to face some big problems. Many people began to notice that some leaders and priests within the church were not behaving very well. They were doing things that were considered bad and not moral in the religion. This made a lot of people lose trust in the church. They didn't think the church's leader were good examples anymore. The church's authority and credibility, which means how much people believed and trusted in what the church said, started to weaken because of these problems. Take for example, the selling of indulgences. What is the selling of indulgences? Back in the day, there was thing called the sale of indulgences. 
It's like people could give money to the church and they thought it would help them avoid spending too much time in a sort of waiting area for the afterlife or even wipe away their mistakes. But this turned forgiveness into a money deal, which doesn't sound so fair, right? One guy named Johan Tatzel was super into promoting this and has actually made a guy named Martin Luther really mad, leading him to speak out against it. Another example is nepotism and simony. What is nepotism and simony? Imagine if your boss always picked their family members for the best jobs. That's nepotism. And then there was simony, which was like buying and selling important roles and favors in the church. These things made it seem like the church was more about power plays and money than about true spiritual stuff. People weren't too happy about it. Another example is moral laxity. Some of the church folks were caught living pretty fancy lives, doing things that didn't exactly match up with the whole good and moral image they were supposed to represent. This was a problem because it felt like they were not practicing what they preached and that made people doubt whether the church was as morally strong as it claimed to be. So, when the Renaissance came around, this loss of trust in the church's leadership was one of the reasons why people were more open to questioning traditional beliefs and looking for new ways of thinking. It was like a time when people wanted to find better answers and make things right again. Another reason was Henry VIII and the papal dispute. What is this papal dispute? Let's see. So there was this king named Henry VIII in England. At first, he was like a big fan of the Catholic Church and even got a gold star from the Pope for defending the church against Martin Luther, who had some different ideas. But then things got a bit messy. See, Henry was married to Catherine of Aragon, but they didn't have a son to keep his family's throne going and he was worried about the future. So he wanted to end the marriage. He thought, he had a good reason because Catherine had been married to his brother before he passed away and Henry thought that wasn't right according to religious rules. Now, Henry went to the Pope whose name was Clement VII and asked for permission to break up with Catherine. But here is the twist. The Pope had good relation with Catherine's family and didn't want to help out. Henry got more and more annoyed because the Pope kept saying no, no, no to his request. Henry thought the Pope was challenging his authority as a king and he wasn't having it. So, guess what? Henry decided he was done waiting. He basically said, I am the boss here and took control of the church in England. He wanted to settle things on his own terms. And that's how King Henry VIII went from being a church supporter to starting his own show with the English church. Crazy, right? Now, what he did, in 1534, King Henry VIII did something that changed the whole game. He put into motion what's called the Act of Supremacy. Basically, he declared himself the big boss of the Church of England and said he had the final say on all things religion in his kingdom. This meant he was cutting ties with the Pope in Rome. Let's check out what happened next because of this bold move. Dissolution of monasteries. Henry wasn't messing around. He saw some religious places like monasteries as potential troublemakers against his rule. So, he used the act of supremacy to shut them down and take their stuff. It was a bit like a power move to make sure no one challenged him. Another thing that happened was the oath of supremacy. As a result of the act, individuals including clergy and government officials were required to take an oath recognizing Henry as the supreme head of the church. Those who refused, such as Sir Thomas More and Bishop John Fisher, faced serious consequences including imprisonment and execution. Next thing that happened was establishment of royal control. With the king as the head of the church, royal control over religious matters increased significantly. This included the appointment of bishops and clergy loyal to the crown, giving Henry greater influence over the church's policies and practices. One more thing that happened was the formation of the Anglican Church. 
This whole act of supremacy business led to the creation of the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church. It was a mix of old school Catholic traditions and some new Protestant ideas, reflecting the religious complexity of that time. And there you have it, a royal power move that changed England's religious scene forever. Another important factor that led to reformation was uh, religious motivations. The first one is reformation ideals. In the heart of the reformation movement was a quest for rediscover the pure teachings of the Bible and rectify the tangled web of questionable practices within the Catholic Church. They believe the church was doing things that weren't right and wanted to fix them. Monasteries were seen as places that had religious excess or too much extra stuff and weren't sticking to the original teachings of Christianity. Some people thought they were going away from what the Bible actually said. Another reason was the monastic criticism. Picture a castle made of gold surrounded by a sea of material riches. This was the image that troubled the minds of those who criticized monasteries. The Reformation architects believed that monasteries were gathering too much treasure while the soul of the community were left unfed. Some reformers argued that the focus on material possessions distracted from the essence of religious devotion and service. They believed the monasteries should be more about helping people spiritually instead of just having lots of stuff. Another reason was idolatry and superstition. Reformers believed that monasteries promoted practices such as worshipping objects or saints too much, which they considered forms of idolatry. They believed that instead of following traditions and rituals, people should focus on their personal connection with God and their own beliefs. Another factor was economic motivations. The monasteries possessed immense wealth, including land, properties and valuable artifacts. By dissolving the monasteries, Henry VIII could collect their assets and significantly bolster the royal treasure. Taking the wealth of the monasteries under royal control provided Henry with greater financial stability, enabling him to maintain his authority and fund various endeavors including military campaigns. Henry rewarded loyal nobles and officials by granting them the properties and lands that monasteries had earlier. This strategy helped secure the loyalty of influential individuals and ensured their continued support for the king. The dissolution of monasteries in England during Henry VIII's reign had a profound impact. It weakened the Catholic Church's influence by closing centers of religious authority and learning while funneling wealth and power to the monarchy. This move marked the rise of the Anglican Church. Edward VI, Henry VIII's young son, ascended to the throne at the age of nine upon his father's death in 1547. Despite his young age, his reign was marked by a continued push for Protestant reforms in the Church of England. Under the regency of Edward Seymour, the Duke of Somerset, and later John Dudley, the Duke of Northumberland, these reforms gained momentum. During the time when Edward VI was king, a big change happened in how people worshipped in the Church of England. They introduced a special book called the Book of Common Prayer in 1549. This book had a set way of doing prayers and rituals during church services that everyone across the country could use. Before that, different places had their own ways of doing things. This new book made everything the same for everyone and made worship more organized and unified. So what is the importance of this book? This book was written in a language that everyone could understand. Unlike before when things were in a language called Latin that not many people knew. This book had all the prayers and words needed for church services like when people get baptized, married or have funerals. It was like a guide for how to do things in a structured way so that everyone did the same things during church. This special book also showed ideas from a new way of thinking about religion called Protestantism. It talked about things like believing in God's forgiveness, listening to what the Bible says and not doing certain things that the old church used to do. This book made worshipping easier to understand and brought people together in a common way of praying. During Edward VI's reign, 
there was a widespread movement to remove images, statues and stained glass from churches. This was in line with reform principles that aimed to eliminate what were perceived as elements of idolatry and superstition. In Edward VI's time as king, the Church of England kept changing to follow Protestant ideas. The Book of Common Prayer made worship the same for everyone and other changes matched new beliefs, leaving a strong influence on how people worshipped and thought about religion in England. Let's see what happened after that. After Edward VI, Queen Mary, who is also called Bloody Mary, took the throne. Mary was the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. She was a devout Catholic. After her accession to the throne in 1553, she was determined to reverse the religious changes that had taken place during his reign and restore Catholicism as the dominant faith in England. So what she did, she started reversing Protestant reforms. Whatever Protestant reforms had been done earlier, she started reversing it. She was too smart. What she did, she married Philip II of Spain, a prominent Catholic monarch, to secure a Catholic alliance and strengthen her position. Her marriage to Philip was seen as an attempt to bolster Catholic influence and suppress Protestantism. Mary and her advisors moved swiftly to reverse the Protestant reforms enacted during the reign of Edward VI. She repealed the laws that had established Protestant doctrines and practices including the laws that had introduced Protestant liturgy and practices. One of the most infamous aspects of Mary's reign was her persecution of Protestants which earned her the epithet Bloody Mary. Back then, Mary made rules against people who believed in Protestant ideas. Special courts were set up to punish these people for their beliefs, calling them wrong. Many Protestants were caught, put on trial, and many were killed because they didn't give up their Protestant beliefs. They were killed by being burned in a painful way. Important people like Archbishop Thomas Cranmer and leaders like Hugh Latimer and Nicola Ridley were also killed this way. Even though Mary one tried really hard to bring back Catholic ways, she faced big problems. First, many people got really mad because of how harshly she treated Protestants and this actually made more people support the Protestants. Second, even though she got married to Philip II and wanted a Catholic child to continue her rule, it didn't happen. And this made everyone unsure about what would happen next in England. Now let's delve into the reign of Elizabeth I and the Elizabethan religious settlement which aimed to establish a middle ground between Catholicism and extreme Protestantism as well as the significance of the 39 articles in defining the doctrinal beliefs of the Church of England. Elizabeth I became Queen of England in 1558 following the tumultuous reigns of her half-siblings Edward VI and Mary I. Elizabeth's religious policies sought to maintain stability and unity in a nation that was deeply divided along religious lines. She aimed to strike a balance between the traditional Catholic beliefs and the Protestant reforms that had taken place. Elizabeth's religious settlement was a comprehensive plan to establish a stable and moderate religious framework in England. Some key aspects of the religious settlement 1559 are Supremacy Act. Similar to her father, Henry VIII, Elizabeth reaffirmed the monarch's authority over the Church of England through the Act of Supremacy. She was declared the supreme governor of the church, avoiding the term supreme head to be more inclusive of those who held traditional Catholic views. Elizabeth issued a set of royal injunctions in 1559 that outlined the religious practices to be followed in the Church of England. These aimed to strike a balance between traditional Catholic practices and Protestant reforms. They allowed for some ceremonial elements and vestments while emphasizing Protestant theological principles. Elizabeth reintroduced a revised version of the Book of Common Prayer. This version retained much of the 1552 edition's Protestant character but also made concessions to traditional Catholic practices in order to foster unity. Now let's see what is this 39 articles of 1563. 
The 39 articles, also called the Articles of Religion, were like a list of important beliefs for the Church of England. They were created to make it clear what the Church believed in about God and religion. These articles helped the Church find a balanced way of thinking between Catholicism and strong Protestant ideas. They wanted to have beliefs that were not too much like one or the other. Uh, kind of in the middle. Elizabeth once time as queen and her religious decisions were very important during the reformation. She wanted to find a middle path between extreme Protestant ideas and Catholic beliefs in England, which helped bring religious peace in England. The 39 articles were like a strong foundation for the Church of England's belief, making it special and influencing its future for a long time. And that's wrap up our journey through the reformation in England. We have seen how beliefs changed, new ideas emerged and history was shaped. Thanks for joining me on this adventure. If you have any suggestions or requests, please write in the comment box. If you like the content, hit the like button, share it with your friends and subscribe to my channel. We will meet in the next video. Till then, keep learning, keep sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening.